Almost. We are live, everyone. Yes, we're good. <laughs> we're live. We're live. All right, well, good evening, and thank you for joining us at this meeting tonight to talk about the Resident Curator Program and to speak specifically about the opportunities at White Gardens. My name is Judy Peterson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for the Park Authority. And my job tonight is to facilitate our presentation and our discussion afterward. We're pleased that um, you've joined us both live in front of me and also online. And um, as I was mentioning, this is our first hybrid meeting that we're doing. So uh, forgive us the technology if there should be any glitches, but we're, we're sort of learning on the, on the go. Um, we've done many in-person in meetings for the Resident Curator Program over the years, but Live streaming is a little bit different, and um, and we think it's going to broaden the audience. So um, so we're glad to do it, and we're going to keep improving. Uh, we're going to be taking questions and comments uh, both live and uh, via the live stream, uh, but we'll tell you about that a little bit later. And um, I want to thank the PIO staff that's going the extra mile to make this happen, as well as the Green Spring staff. You know, Eileen is here and. Hopefully, we'll meet the new manager. Uh, she'll be coming in at some point. Uh, Judy's exit. Um, although, if you, uh, you're here. I'm sorry, you're so new. I didn't recognize you. <laughs> Judy, would you like to just stand up or come up here so everybody can see you on camera? Hello. I'm the new site manager here at Green Spring Gardens. My name is Judy Zatzik. And when I say new, I really mean that I'm, this is my going on my third week right now. Um, but I'm so glad that you all came out for this meeting. Green Spring does play a role in the management of the horticultural resources at the property. So you may see teams of volunteers that are coming actually from Green Spring to help um, manage various problems or issues that we might have uh, with the buildings there. So we've got horticulturists on staff here and experts, um, and we have been working with the Park Authority all along to help develop um, a very beautiful collection of azaleas and really on the site. So you may see me at the site sometime, um, and I look forward to working with everyone on this project. Thank you, and welcome. We're glad to have you. All right, um, I want to take a moment to note that um, we have endeavored to spread the word about this meeting. Um, we have sent an information release to about 300 media outlets. Uh, we pushed that information out on our social media platforms. There's been signage at the site. Uh, we reached out to an existing uh, stakeholder list uh, via email, and uh, of course, it's been on the web on the RC3 site. Uh, tonight is an opportunity for you to become familiar with our program. Um, and this lovely property, and for us to hear from you regarding any questions or concerns or ideas that you may have. I want to also mention that we have um, Ron Kendall here, who is the uh, Mason District Park Authority representative, and he is listening and he is taking copious notes and is going to go back and tell Penny Grace, the supervisor, all about what we do, in case she's not watching. And I should say that um, we have the benefit of this now being immortalized, so we'll post this on the website. So those who aren't here or weren't able to watch at home tonight could watch this whenever they want. So um, let me uh, start by introducing some of the staff members in attendance. Uh, Stephanie Langton, who is uh, the FCPA Resident Curative Program Manager. And uh, Hannah is in the back, and Joe from the Public Information Office, and virtually my webmaster, Don. Don, hello, and thank you for what you're doing. Um, 
So now without uh, further ado, let me step aside and uh, let's get an overview of the RCP program. We'll provide a little bit of background on white gardens and then uh, we'll take your questions and comments um, about a potential resident curator program, which we hope is going to thrive at that location and enhance our mission. So Stephanie, let me uh, move some slides. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight and for your interest in the White Gardens property and in the Resident Curative Program. Um, as Ms. Beard said, my name is Stephanie Lincoln, and I oversee the Resident Curative Program. And we've prepared just a brief PowerPoint discussion to share with you all tonight. Um, so we'll begin with an overview of the Resident Curative Program and its background. And we will then turn our attention to focus on the White Gardens property. On the mission of the park uh, and the piece of projects that have been undertaken there to support that mission. And then finally, we will look at the resident curator program and how it really fits and aligns with the park's mission and the park's needs. Um, and of course, as Ms. Peterson said, there will be an opportunity for questions. And so let's dive in. The purpose of the resident of our resident curator program is to preserve and put back to use a locality's publicly owned historic properties that are vacant or underutilized and needing significant repairs and improvement. So it enables the locality to offer long-term lease agreements to qualified tenants with no cash rent collected in exchange for their financial commitment to rehabilitate and maintain the property, A, in accordance with the set of preservation standards, and B, providing reasonable public use, which I'll discuss. Um, so in 2014, Fairfax County actually became the first locality in Virginia to adopt the resident area program. And it was adopted in accordance with the 2011 enabling legislation of the state um, that authorized localities to adopt such programs. You know, there are certain basic requirements that the legislation um, puts forth, and they include the following. So the first is the property has to be historic. And so what that means for the Fairfax County ordinance is that the property has to be listed or eligible for listing on the county's inventory of historic sites. The second is that all the work that's done at the property must be done in accordance with a set of preservation standards. So what that means for the Fairfax County uh, program is that all the work that's done must be in accordance with what's called the Secretary of the Interior's Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties. And these are nationally established guidelines that are administered through the National and then finally, um, the curator site must provide uh, what's called reasonable public access. And how that's written in the county ordinance is that the access must be uh, consistent with the historic nature and the use of the property. So typically what we see is um, these occur in the form of annual open house events. So these are the basic components of the program. Um, so now let's take a look at a, at a snapshot of the program status and our accomplishments to date. So currently we have four curator properties. Um, the first uh, to join um, the curator uh, status is the Spencer House down in Wharton. The lease was signed in 2017. So the curator is, has been in a little over four years now um, into a new lease. And um, he's tackled a significant amount of, of work there. Um, upcoming projects include exterior improvements, including painting. Next is the Turner Farmhouse in Great Falls. The lease for this curator property was signed in 2018. And so the curator is about three years into a 20 year lease. Now, currently the lease is residential, but um, the curator is pursuing a special exception approval for the use of the um, retreat center from the board of, uh, for the use of the property um, as a retreat center um, using some of the outbuildings on the lease property to um, have a small retreat there. <clears throat> the next is the Hanapi Clark and Yeti property. Um, the lease was signed more recently in 2020, so the curator has been in there just a little over a year now, um, into a 13-year lease. And uh, the curator has also done some substantial work already. You can see the kitchen upgrades, new kitchen appliances. Um, and most recently, <clears throat> and most recently in 20, uh, 
uh, 20 months, a few months ago, uh, the Elmore Farmhouse Curator lease was signed. And this was signed for a 29 year lease. Um, now, no work has occurred at the property just yet, just like Turner, the curators are pursuing a um, special exception application uh, approval for nonprofit use of the house, which would be service source to use as a satellite office for programming for um, its clients, adults with disabilities. Now, how we determine the length of the lease in the curator program, we use a formula, which roughly comes out to taking the total estimated cost of, re of repairs for the property and dividing the annual fair market rental value into that amount. And that roughly sits out the years of the lease. Now, looking ahead, we're excited to be advertising both the Margaret White Gardens property um, and the Asheville Field property in Vienna later this summer. So let's now take a look at what the application process and the curator selection process looks like in the curator program. So to open up the application period, we will post an invitation to submit applications online um, along with the application package for applicants to fill out. Uh, we notify our stakeholders via information release, our stakeholder email addresses. Um, so I do encourage if you haven't already signed the sign-in sheet at the, at the front end of the table, um, it's the best way to stay informed on new property offerings and program updates. Um, we will post updates to our website and do social media updates as well. So the application period is open for 60 calendar days. And once the deadline closes, the resident curator program staff will begin review. Um, and the review is really a three-pronged approach. We'll begin with a quick administrative review to make sure the application has all the materials there that have been requested um, and that we don't have to you know, go back with, uh, to the applicant with questions. The, applicant that, the applications that are complete will go on to a financial review. Now, the financial review is conducted um, through the County Department of Finance, our, our contacts there, um, resident period program staff don't um, do that side of the, the review. Um, and of course, there are financial components that are requested in the application package because curators are uh, responsible for all of the costs associated with the rehabilitation of the property. So materials, equipment, rental, contractor costs. Um, we do offer a unique incentive wherein um, the curators own labor and sweat equity can count towards the total investment. Um, we, you know, during these negotiations, we'll assign an hourly rate. Um, so the applications that pass the financial review then return to resident curator program staff and go to the evaluation team. And this is sort of the last stage in the process. The evaluation team is comprised of um, relevant park authority board, county, uh, uh, or park authority, sorry, staff members, county staff members who have a um, involvement and knowledge in the park and in the property in question. And ultimately the evaluation team will score the applications based on established criteria, which we'll go over in a, in a second. Um, but first there is a 30 day public comment period. Um, also a public hearing during which the applicants are invited to present their proposals to the evaluation team and to the public um, to answer comments and receive, or to answer questions and receive comments. So following the um, comment period, the evaluation team uh, will reconvene in a uh, meeting that is open to the public to score the applications. And the applications are scored on the following criteria. So the first is the proposed reuse of the property. Is it consistent with the historic nature of the property? Is it consistent with the park's mission um, and goals? Second is the scope, of nature, uh, scope and nature of the public benefit, public access component. Um, and this is what we, we talked about earlier with the reasonable public use. Is this is an opportunity in the application package for the applicant to either propose um, alternatives to an open house or um, activities to supplement the open house and perhaps you know, blogging the work that's being done at the property. Next is the rehabilitation plan. Um, now this is a critical component of the application. Each property in the program has what's called a historic structure report and treatment plan. And this is a document that is done by a third party consultant. They come in and assess the condition of the property and they put together an itemized list of tasks um, that are required for the improvement of the property with cost estimates. And this largely forms the basis 
of the curator's work plan. Um, so this is an opportunity in the application package for the applicant to outline their timeline, their milestones, um, benchmark projects for each year. The program does request that, that the majority of the work, if not all of the work, is completed within the first five years of the lease. So this is the opportunity to share you know, who shouldn't be doing the work, the curator or contractors, any cost estimate adjustments, that sort of thing. We also look at experience and qualifications. Um, does the curator have, or does the applicant have previous experience uh, rehabbing historic houses, any specialized skill in historic preservation? We'll look at the overall presentation and organization of the application package. Um, is it clear, is it concise, does it meet the goals and guidelines of the application package? And finally, we'll look at, of course, the public response. What is the public's reaction to the proposal? So the evaluation team will score each application, and the application with the highest score um, will be selected and shared with the Park Authority Board, um, at which time the Park Authority Board and Board of Supervisors in the same process will begin. So that's a basic overview of the application process and the selection process. So now let's turn our attention to the White Garden property um, and how the resident curator program applies here. So the John C. and Margaret K. White Horticultural Park has a master plan from 2006, which enumerates the goals and objectives of the park, which is primarily horticultural park, um, which include preserving and enhancing the horticultural collection, ensuring that sensitive resources are appropriately maintained and preserved, offering stewardship opportunities, educational opportunities, interpretive opportunities, um, all to produce a quality, positive user experience. So this is a resource-based park, um, and I'd like to briefly touch on the kind of cultural and historic significance of these resources, so I'm sure you're, you're familiar with the history. So in uh, 1938, the Whites purchased the 13 acres. In 1939, uh, they contracted with architect Joe Lapish to have the two-story brick residence built um, with much of the notable original character defining features uh, still remaining, the, the interior used staircase, the crown molding, the um, chair railing, the, the fireplace uh, mantle and frame. On the exterior, there's executives of mental brick arches over the, uh, over the windows, especially with the enclosed um, glass porch. So the whites were uh, horticulture enthusiasts, and they started cultivating their garden in the late 1940s. Um, and over the rest of the 20th century, over their plantings grew to, to what's there now, and really created a landscape um, with distinct areas all around the property, um, little ecosystems. So at the time they purchased the land and uh, built their home, the area, of course, was primarily farmland. And as suburban development expanded in the area, um, the existing residential neighborhoods sort of developed the property as we see today. But this, there is a circa 1876 um, barn that is sort of the sole surviving building that kind of attests to this uh, agricultural history on the property. So the property offers a, a significant legacy to preserve. Um, and towards that end, a significant amount of work has been done already um, accomplished on the grounds and the house um, to support that. And so first we'll take a look at um, some of the projects that have been undertaken recently at the, at the park on the grounds. Um, the first is in 2016, there was a phase one archeology span uh, investigation that was conducted. In 2017, a cultural landscape report was produced. In 2017, um, there was meadow restoration work that was done to take the existing field um, and make it a native plant dominated grassland while managing the non native uh, uh, invasive species. Um, and was a successful project that in 2019, uh, the meadow work received the Best New Environmental Sustainability Award from uh, Virginia. Recreation and Park Society. And there were also uh, improvements made to the entrance drive, um, the installation of stone on the upper driveway, fencing, drainage improvements. Um, and finally, ongoing uh, is the horticultural restoration project, which has already conducted its inventory of the collection, um, has gone through a planning and design phase, and will soon get begin the implementation. 
going to be improvements in the house. Um, in 2017, a historic structure report and treatment plan, as I mentioned before, uh, was conducted. There was also significant mold remediation that occurred 2019 into 2020, which uh, greatly improved the interior condition of the house, um, involving the removal of wallpaper, um, the remediation work, and you know, painting. And most recently, there have been HVAC upgrades and, and replacements. So now let's take a look at the resident curator program's role in preserving and enhancing the legacy of the park's resources and supporting the mission of the park. Um, so in accordance with the 2006 master plan, the resident curator program will only be accepting residential uses uh, for the White Gardens House. Nonprofits will not be eligible to apply. To that end, also curator parking spots will be limited to a maximum of two designated spots um, in an area which will not interfere with the use and use in traffic. Uh, especially as it relates to, I know there are volunteer work days and horticulture projects that are being undertaken um, and, and that are ongoing um, and those will continue uninterrupted um, as will the use of the trail. And I do want to call out two areas to outline um, in terms of the program's expectations of the, the curator um, as it relates to one, the barn, and two, the horticulture collection. Um, curators are not expected to contribute or participate in any improvements or activities um, as it relates cities. If the curator is interested in use of the barn, um, uh, they could propose in their application package what improvements they would like to make. Um, same with the horticultural collection. If the, if the applicant would like to be involved, that's certainly something that they can include in the application um, package for consideration. So now as we gear up, um, to advertise later this summer. I'd like to call your attention to the way we will continue to communicate. Uh, we will, you know, information releases, social media updates, uh, signage at the property, our stakeholder emails will go out, the resident curator program um, website updates. And for the next steps, of course, the public information meeting this evening, so it kicks off this process. Um, but we do invite you to join us on Saturday, August 7th at the White Gardens property uh, between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. for an open house event. Um, parking will be on site. Guests will be directed not to park on the street entrance, but rather um, by the house. Um, and then do look forward to the application package being posted online on the Resident Curator Program um, website later in, in August. Um, and with that, I want to thank you for your time this evening. I know the presentation is a little lengthier than some of the usual presentations, so I will now turn the meeting back over to Ms. Peterson for questions and comments. Thank you very much, Stephanie. All right, uh, now, of course, we're going to hear from you, probably the most important part of our meeting this evening. And also, uh, there is an opportunity um, for you who are watching um, via the live stream to send us your comments and uh, they should pop up on my computer over there and we'll figure out how to actually read them from here. But um, in any case, we're gonna, we're gonna make this work. Um, so we welcome your questions and comments. The only thing I would ask you is because we are um, live, if you could come up to the microphone and ask those questions or comments, it would just be a little helpful for our team here. So, um, are there any questions or comments that people would like to, if you would be so kind as to come up? If you would be kind enough to tell me your name, please. My name is Mary Gashaw, I'm a resident of the neighborhood and go to White Gardens frequently. My question is, there was a $500,000 bond issue voted some years back, uh, which included mention of trails. There really aren't any trails in White Gardens, they're overgrown. I don't know if like, walk over the country I'm just wondering what, what do you, um, when a resident curator moves into the house and renovates it, doesn't it sort of turn into a private residence? And as you said, maybe once a year they'll have this annual event open house where the public can go. But as it currently stands, the public can freely come and go to the park right now. So doesn't this really seriously uh, limit the um, um, ability of the public to? utilize the park just to, you know, to walk a dog, to, to walk around with the flowers. Um, because essentially you're sort of walking across a private residence at that point, because it is the least, as you say. And uh, for how many years did you say? 29, I forget how many. 
the white garments and these feathers, but I mean, it's these for a, a long period of time. And it just seems to me that, you know, the barn being in this sort of barn, it seems to me, particularly during the pandemic, there could be some really interesting opportunities to have some community events there, maybe some picnics or the like, you know, and it just it seems to me that it really takes this property out of public usage for a significant amount of time. So I wondered if you might address those concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we certainly work with each property um, designating a curator least boundary. Um, and particularly the approach to this property with the understanding that it might be more narrow, you know, more close to the house than, than the amount of land that other properties in the curator program would get. Um, and, and certainly the curator would, the selected curator would, would know about the, um, the activities that go on and the work that go on there and, you know, people who, um, use the park because the park um, will be doing that continually. Um, and so it would be something that we would sort of negotiate with the curator when we select the, the curator boundaries of the site. Um, but... Yeah, I would just like to note also that, you know, one of the reasons the curator program started was because we didn't have the uh, financial wherewithal to care for these older properties. And so, um, as was mentioned, the benefit is that the, the people who come onto the property and undertake the curative program are required to upkeep the properties. And so that's a major a significant benefit to the public. Thanks. Uh, my name is Teresa Leonardo. I'm also a, a resident of the neighborhood that the park is in. I'm a pretty new resident to Fairfax. Um, and I also go to the park quite frequently and also live actually right on the street. So I see everybody else working to the park. So first I want to echo the comment that the park gets considerable neighborhood usage. Um, I've also talked to someone who was a friend of Mrs. White and knew her at the time when she made the gift to the park. And I guess I really question based on what I've heard that anything that reduces public access to the park would be consistent with the intent of the gift. Um, where she really wanted to maintain this as a public resource. And that's why um, the, the county was able to essentially purchase that land for, I believe, a million dollars, which was way, way below market value. So I think that's something that needs to be looked at. Um, second, well, I, it was great to see the list of projects that have happened um, on the land. Uh, when I go to the park, um, you know, I see porcelain bear in particular overtaking tulip trees, and it's uh, it's devastating. And and just as someone who lives like in that neighborhood, that house is older than other houses. It's maybe a little bit fancier than houses, but I think the main value of that area, that property, really is the land and the, the great biodiversity of the pollinator garden, of the, the meadow, as well as. Um, the rhododendron and azalea garden. And I actually did a little pollinator survey, and I'm not good at identifying bees, but even I was able to identify six different bee species and tremendous abundance of pollinators um, right there. So I really think the natural heritage is something that also really has to be looked at as a value. And related to that, I wanted to know if you could better clarify or provide a little more detail on the management responsibilities for the natural resources. Um, you, when you were talking about the boundary just now, my, my actual follow-up question uh, was, if you could be a little more specific about how you think um, the management of the natural resources would be defined uh, and what really the plan for that is, because um, just based on my observations of the park over the last six months, I would say if management of the natural resources doesn't significantly increase in the next few years, the, the natural resource value of the park is going to plummet because I mean, the porcelain berry there is literally insane um, and it's so aggressive. And yeah, um, I think those are my questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you want to address this? Yeah, sure. Well, unfortunately, I can't speak to the natural side of things. The resident curator program, the purview is for the historic structure. Um, but I will say that the, both the deed to the property and the the master plan do allow for residential use, rental use of the house, um, as long as uh, all of the sort of money that's put in it or, or raised or whatever goes towards the property, which I can't think of a better um, opportunity than the resident curator program um, for, for doing that. 
So I can just add that the reason we do these meetings is to hear the kind of comments that you give. Um, and so um, I don't think that's necessarily an unknown. We do have a primer program. Um, we do have some volunteer. Would you talk to it, Mary? Mary is uh, our uh, park operations manager for RMD, but you got to come up here like everybody else. <laughs> And Mary, you spent some time out there, is that correct? Um, yes, I'm Mary Lee. Yes, I have spent on quite a bit of time. As part of my career with the park authority, I was manager here at Green Spring Gardens. Um, two managers for Judy during the time that I was manager from the um, time that Mrs. White passed away in 2010 or 2017. Anyway, at that point, we initiated um, Work days, volunteer work days to manage the um, invasives, as you say. That's why some very terrible there. So um, I would like at some point in the future, perhaps these work days would continue. And so I, we need to let Judy get her feet a little bit wet before we um, actually throw that um, piece of responsibility on her. So we could look forward to that um, next spring. I would encourage you, if you're interested in these work days, that may depend on how the curator program does move forward. Um, we have spoken with um, the resident creator team frequently about the use of the park by the community and what is there. And so they have been in consultation with us in looking at how this resident creator program will go forward. So if it goes forward in the sense that, as, um, as it sounds like it, that there'll be a perimeter around the house so they can have a little bit of yard if they're not interested in the collection. And then the remainder would remain open to the public and we would like to begin the work days again. So you could be in touch with Judy, let her know your contact information, and once we get the work days back in the probably in the springtime at this point, um, then we would be happy to have as many people in the neighborhood come and join us to be sure that the resources that you really enjoy are protected. And so I think so the one um, speaker asked about the 500,000. That was so part of the metal restoration that you see was funded by that, as well as what we're calling the horticulture restoration. So we identified the collections, what seems quite bad, what is actually there, what do we need to add, how will we plant it, and then the next step will be how will we maintain that. So that's just a small portion, maybe about 20% of what that 500,000 would be. So we look forward to actually preserving property that um, Mrs. White, as well as her husband, John, um, put many years of loving care into. Thank you, Mary. Don't, don't go away. Okay? No, I'll leave the way now. Don't leave the room. We might, we might need your expertise. Please. Hi, my name is Clint Downing. My wife, Joanna. I had a, a couple of questions, but I think one of them may have been partially answered in her comments. First off, on the August 7th open house, is that the only opportunity to view the house, the property? No, no, I think we tell we're able to coordinate as a hot show and meet on the house. Okay. And then the question that was partially answered, I was curious about the amount of land surrounding the house that would be the curator's you know, direct responsibility, and then the proximity of the farm to the house. I mean, great about the presentation, but I, I couldn't get a sense of, you know, if they're physically located adjacent or... They're pretty close. There's a circular drive that sort of separates the two structures. Okay. And then finally, relative to the barn, I assume it's an active barn. Would there be, you know, availability to equestrian? Currently, I believe the only use is for the work days, um, the horticultural group, they can send their equipment there um, on site. Other than that, it's, it's partly um, unused. And, and the then, curators, and, and how much land would, would be under the curators for you? That's to be determined with working with all the, the groups to make sure that everyone has access to the collection. Um, but it would be, it would be rather than Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Please. Hi, my name is Steve Mazita. My wife and I are prospective curators. I'm also a master naturalist. So uh, when I walked in 
Uh, we went and visited the property on Sunday and I saw all the stuff that we're doing. I was like, oh my gosh, I put my name in here. I'm going to start for three months. Oh, we know all the first. Um, we didn't get there. So, um, I, I had questions about the, the report that was done in 2017, and I'm glad to see that some of that work was done. Uh, one of the, the major things I identified was the potential water damage to the foundation and the water infiltration into the basement. Uh, noted that you took care of the mold, which is good, but was the water uh, issue taken care of? Was that still outstanding? This seemed to be the biggest single project in that. In that sure, sure. There's currently no kind of active water um, infiltration occurring, and we have slightly adjusted the existing treatment plan to modify what it requires um, for the, for the uh, specifically for that issue. Um, and so that would be made available with the application package as well, as sort of the updates and, and it does um, kind of touch on, on updates for that section. Okay, yeah, that, that was one of our things. This one is obviously four years old, and that was a pretty expensive uh, thing. To, we were able to reduce, so there's a sweet spot for the resident carrier, carrier program that we're finding is um, anywhere between 150000 to 400000 in terms of, you know, an incentive for carriers to invest in the property. Right. And this original treatment plan does sort of exceed that dollar amount. Um, and so we did make some adjustments and included in the application package and posted online. So was part of that adjustment taking the barn out? The barn is part of, no, exactly. Right. Yes, that, the barn was part of the draw for us. That, that, that too, but the, the carrier, if, if the applicant is interested in, in using the in using the barn, they certainly will be an opportunity in the application package to, to fill that out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. We're going to turn to some comments that have come in. Uh, let's see. So Emily reminds people to refresh your screen if you can't see the live stream. Passing that along, okay. Uh, Nisha Smirnoff, uh, do you provide resources or suggestions for contracts or companies to use for historical improvements? We can certainly offer, you know, what we've uh, experienced and we work with in the past, but um, you know, that's, that's sort of up to the curator to, to identify. And then uh, Ann Stunt asks, uh, did you say there are only two parking spaces? If I heard that right, what is the plan for parking for curators, visitors? That's something that we would have to, to work out during the police negotiations and identifying the parking space for the curator and the curator boundary. And so another um, viewer says it's difficult to hear and the transcription is way ahead of the audio. Uh, so it's confusing until I realize that. So I apologize and we'll, we'll do our best to, uh, to finesse this in the future. Okay. Um, and you can shut off the closed captioning by clicking the white CC at the bottom of the right, uh, right for the video, if that helps. Okay. And um, one other question. Naturally, historic homeowners insurance comes with heavy premiums. Does the parks program take care of homeowners insurance, or is this the responsibility of the resident curator? The curator is responsible for renters insurance, but the parks program is also part of the as well. Okay, there you have it. Now we're going to go back to live. Yes, sir, if you tell me your name, please. Uh, my name is John Gill, uh, and I'm not from the group. Uh, uh, one of the questions that came up to me, uh, and, and it concerned the issue that these two people raised, is does the Park Authority uh, budget annually for the maintenance of the grounds in the parks, for example, especially a park like this one that has such uh, Specific horticultural mission. Uh, is, that a, is that a budget, a line item budget item in the annual budgets? That's a good question. And if we and can't, well, it sounds like it, it just created the idea in my mind that if you don't have volunteers, it's not going to get done. And I thought well, that's certainly probably not the case. But I thought I would ask. Mary O'Lean again. Um, he asked a very um, interesting question. So, yes, the county does support the park with their general fund budget. As you may expect, it's not adequate 
to do all of the maintenance that we would like to do. So parks like Green Spring Gardens are also supported by our revenue program as well as their own expenses. So it's a combination of budgets that support the park. And so at the current time, we don't have enough resources or enough staff to do as much natural resource management and park management as I think that um, park as well as our um, park leadership as well. Another question? <laughs> Uh, my, my main question, though, is are the uh, prior uh, applications public records? If you can, you'd be able to provide redacted personal information. Uh, well, not exactly personal information, uh, as, but as in terms example. of the, the prior, not all of them, but particularly the ones that have been accepted. Are, they, are they available to public students? Absolutely. Okay. All right, thank you. Over here. Yeah, but I would just begin to say, since they have a lot of financial information and such like that, um, we would need to run it through the county attorney and make sure that we were not releasing anything that was uh, you know, proprietary, so to speak. Is there anybody else who would like to uh, speak this evening? Can you take a peek and see if there's anybody on, online? And um, yes, please. This is Steve Reseda again. You mentioned the 60 days that the application window is open and then all those steps. What's the total timeline um, for the whole process to run? Yeah, sure. So one to 60 calendar uh, days. Yeah. Can you guys hear me now? Okay, so once the calendar, uh, the 60 calendar days ends for the application period, the application review, depending on the amount of the number of applications we receive, could take about maybe three to four months. Um, Upon that, you know, time we would get a, uh, a selected curator, um, and then the legal process would begin. Um, and depending on there's another division within the park authority that draft releases, um, and they of course have other uh, uh, items to do in their, in their work plan. And so, pending their schedule and, and timeline, that could take another three months to maybe six months or so. There is a board of supervisors public hearing that has to occur um, as part of that process. And all of the public processes to require time for us to advertise them and then to have a public comment period. So I believe Stephanie is very optimistic, um, but it does take a while. We like to think because we're choosing so well, and it takes us just a little bit longer. Joe, are there any other folks who were brave enough to? Okay. Um, I'll ask. Hopefully, you can hear me. Uh, for the do you provide resources or suggestions for contracts and companies to use for historical improvements? So I, I think that was already asked. Um, oh, already, but we're, sorry. Yeah, we're, we're um, although we can probably tell people what other folks have used, we can never really endorse a particular company um, or say that this is the guy you should go to. It's against uh, county policy. So is there anybody else who'd like? Yes, please. And a perspective three. In the past few months, I've looked at two properties, uh, Lost Valley in back in April, and I've had a lot of problems this past week. And the initial concerns of a lot of residents was will this remain a public space? I said, that's public. That caused my mind in terms of how to preserve and promote public use. And both my three trips to the property, the number of people walk through with the dogs, and the dog walk. And for me, as I'm concerned, it is a public park, public space. If I were a resident curator, I have a property, you should be walking to walk your dog through, you should have your dog. And I've been thinking about ways of how to promote the use of that property, and I don't know where the borderline is. Um, Commercial versus something else. In the case of light gardens, that can have some close porch, black, that can be a mess. And for the celebration, anniversary celebration, to bring in bigger defense, I could charge per se, and if the resident takes a stipend, the resident publicly, 
what point does, I guess, promoting public use become a commercial venture? Well, with the White Garden property, we did make a um, decision to make it a purely residential um, use, and that is because of all of the different interest groups um, and just the nature of the park. <clears throat> um, in terms of other properties and applicants, if we do advertise to accept different types of uses, uh, applicants could propose a, a nonprofit um, a nonprofit use um, for different sites, um, but White Garden is a little residential in order to say, you know, in, in keeping with the mission of the nature of the, of the park. More questions? Okay. Um, I'm in the conceit here. So, can you review the financial responsibilities of the curator? I did not hear clearly before. Well, the curators are responsible for all costs associated with the rehabilitation. So materials, equipment rentals, contractor costs. Um, we do credit the curator's sweat equity of our own labor towards their total investment. Um, and during these negotiations, we put an hourly uh, rate to the curator's labor. Um, and so within the application package, there is sort of a, um, a financial component with financial information requested for financial review. Any other questions, Anna? I know there's a bit of a, uh, yes, please. A bit of a delay online. So if we miss your question, there is an opportunity to send us comments and uh, to park mail, and we'll continue to, to take those for your What about the potential for organizing small groups of uh, people who in school children who want to go on a nature walk or artists who want to paint? Um, you know, like gardens, outdoors, small local groups that are nonprofit and they would not require parking, or they could park over to the college school and then walk to the bike gardens. What about that? It's not commercial, but it's a small group of citizens that might organize some small events. What about that? Through the revenue curator? Yeah. How would that This is Mary O'Lee again. How about if I address the public access portion and then Stephanie can address how that meshes with the, um, the resident curator program? Currently, it is a walk to parking. I've heard that expression a couple times this evening, and that's because it does not have it has basically a substandard entrance for public use as well as no parking. So there's nothing to prohibit small groups from using any of our parks in most instances. So you could park somewhere off site and then walk in to use the park. So if you have a small artist on plan, so the art um, skills there, so that kind of group, or somebody wants to bring small groups of children to walk, they could do that. So as a walk to park. So how that works with the resident curator program, I'll turn that back over to Stephanie. I mean, for those reasons, it seems like it would not fall under the, the purview of the resident curator program. But if it's something that an interest group is interested in, or, or a community group is interested in doing to kind of supplement the resident curator program or what's going on there, I mean, that, can, that would be something to consider. And we do have a permits process. If you wanted to come to any park, you could get a permit, um, depending on the size of the group, depending on the activity. And um, I believe that that's probably kicking to some extent here, or coordinate with whatever Green Spring Gardens will be doing in terms of any, uh, you know, any of their teams coming on to do some horticultural work. So I, you know, I think we're open to ideas, but I think clearly we want to keep the resident um, curator program residential because of the limitations with parking and also with fire truck time and many of the limits of the site. Is there anybody else here that would like to comment or question? And is there anybody else? No? Okay. All right. Well, is there anything you wanted to add? I don't know. Mary? I'm excited.
All right. Well, um, I want to thank everybody for coming out this evening. And um, I think we got the ball rolling. Hopefully there is uh, somebody who's a potential applicant and a potentially successful applicant. Uh, the open house is going to be on August 7th from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. And you're arranging off-site uh, parking, I believe. Parking will or be on-site. It will be on-site. Okay. All right. And um, I guess, and how long uh, you'll be accepting comments for a while? For a minute. Uh-huh. Yeah. So send them to parkmail at fairfaxcounty.gov. Um, and I would also say to those watching, um, I'm sorry if you were frustrated. We're going to endeavor to be better. And if you would be kind enough to tell us how we can improve, that would be very useful to us as well. So with that, I'm going to close the meeting, and I thank you all for coming out this evening. Be safe. Good night. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. So Stephanie, so with, uh, Michelle and I want to actually look at a prior application. Can we just give you a call and